Thanks, Claire. Thank you. I'm the Keeper of the University of Nottingham Museum. I'd like to welcome everybody here today. And um, it's great also to start the new year by welcoming back uh, Dr. Fraser Hunter, who's the Principal Curator of Iron Age and Roman Scotland at the National Museum of Scotland. Um, now, through his excavation and research of material culture, his research interests include Celtic art, uh, the impact of Rome, and Iron Age material <coughs> culture. Um, now, many of you will have been to his last talk he gave here, but today he's going to be talking about the museum's latest exhi uh, exhibition, which is called Scotland's Early Silver. I have to say I've seen it myself. It's an absolutely fantastic exhibition, and it is on, in fact, to the 25th of February. I think that's right. And uh, so, without further ado, I will pass you over to Fraser, who will be talking today about From Roman Bribes to Pictish Treasures, Early Silver in Scotland and Beyond. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Claire. Thank you all for turning out under what I fear are false pretenses. Given that you have a Viking exhibition in the museum at the moment, there are no Vikings in this talk. Or they make a fleeting appearance at the end. We're in much more interesting territory today. <laughs> the rest of the first millennium AD. And what I want to talk about is the history of silver. The history of silver in Scotland at a time when it was the prestige metal when silver rather than gold was the metal of choice to show off with. What I'm really telling you is if you like a cultural biography of, of silver, how it was used, how it was used to show off with, where it came from and so forth. A history in seven steps. So over the next 45, 50 minutes or so, we'll walk through these seven steps of silver. And this is based on a research project that I've been involved with along with some colleagues sponsored by Good Morning J Whiskey Company, my favourite ever sponsor. <laughs> Not just sponsoring in kind, I should emphasise, that wouldn't help our research focus. <laughs> but um, they've been very generous, particularly in supporting a research post. And my colleague Alice Blackwell, who I've been working with in this project, um, has been supported by this. So why silver? <clears throat> silver was a new metal coming into Scotland at the end of the Iron Age. Although we have silver in Scotland, there's no evidence of it being exploited because getting silver out of the ground is difficult. You have to smelt lead and extract it from the lead and so on. It's quite a complicated process. So in the Iron Age, starting our story 2,000 years ago, prestige was shown in gold and in bronze. If you look at the great pieces of Celtic art in the north, it's gold and bronze are the materials being used. Silver is new. Who brings this stuff to Scotland? The Romans. <laughs> we can blame the Romans for many things, but actually they're critical to this story here. Now, the Roman impact in Scotland is, is, is very varied, and I talked quite extensively about that last time I was here. Today we're focusing very much on this one material. For silver comes to Scotland in the pockets of the legions. For the Roman world, silver is normal. Silver is every day. Silver is part of the circulating currency of the Roman economy. A single silver coin, a denarius, is more or less a day's pay for a soldier at this period. And it's part of a currency system with gold at the top and a whole series of bronze small change at the bottom. So silver is the kind of thing which is fundamental to the Roman economy. But it's also a prestige metal in the Roman world. So on the frontier, as I say, a silver coin is a day's pay. You don't just lob them around to anybody. Other materials, like brooches and jewellery, are rare in silver. So silver in the Roman world is still used to show status. The silver brooch here is one of only six known from Scotland. The silver necklace with its wheel and its crescent, probably symbolising the sun and the moon, is a very rare piece indeed. But this currency stuck to the forts. It didn't really move beyond the forts. There wasn't a money economy in Scotland at this time. So it was really only usable in the forts and the immediate environment. Some of the jewellery moved. We see as the Romans were building relationships with the local populations, they, they give gifts, they come to deals with them, and a few of those deals involved the movement of pieces of silver. Very rare pieces of silver jewellery coming onto Iron Age sites, 
finger rings and bracelets, which I show here, including the wonderful gem of the god Sylvanus. This from 200 miles north of the Roman frontier. These would have been real status symbols in Iron Age society at the time. The first silver coming into local hands. So that's our first step. Silver comes in with the Roman world, sticks mostly around the army sites, and little bits of it come into local hands. It's exotic new material. But the real step change in silver comes when the Romans give up trying to conquer Scotland. This is the, the more interesting Roman frontier, the Antonine Wall. Everyone's heard of Hadrian's Wall. It's so overdone. <laughs> the Antonine Wall running from Forth to Clyde gets much less press because it's less well preserved. It was a timber and turf wall. But this was, for 20 years, the northernmost edge of the Roman Empire. And when it's abandoned in the 160s, the Romans pull back to Hadrian's Wall, but they retain an interest in what happens beyond the frontier. Roman influence doesn't just stop at the wall. They need to know what's happening beyond the wall. They try to influence what's happening beyond the wall to get some control for their own security. How do they do that? The tool they use is silver. A flood of silver coins comes north. In this period after the abandonment of the Antonine Wall, we have over 40 coin hoards, over 6,000 coins coming out of the country. This is just the tip of a silver iceberg. And what we're seeing here effectively is frontier diplomacy. Each of these dots marks a point where a coin hoard has come from. This is bribery and corruption on the frontier, if you like. Silver being used as a diplomatic tool. And we can tease that story apart with one particular case study. The site of Burnie, up near Elgin in northeast Scotland. Burnie is a site that I was involved in excavating for a number of years. It's a site where we knew there was an Iron Age settlement in the field. You can see in the ripening barley this is the kind of stuff that ultimately turns into the England Morange's fine product. <laughs> As it ripens, you'll see the marks of prehistoric houses poking through. So we knew there was an Iron Age settlement in this field. But metal detecting over it revealed there were silver coins as well. Now we are 200 miles north of the Roman frontier at this point. Why is Roman silver coming out of this field? Well, that's what we set out to find out. And we revealed a story of a power centre, a place that grew in importance in the centuries before Rome, and a place that was a local peak in the 1st and 2nd centuries AD, a place of massive houses. The building here, entranceway, the outer wall would have run all the way around there, substantial post string for a building 20 metres in diameter. That is pretty much as big as this hall here. This is a huge structure. And this was not just a place of big buildings, it was a centre of craft and industry. There were the remains of iron furnaces, blacksmithing, bronze casting, pottery making, all kinds of craft skills at this site. It was a well-connected place. They were making glass beads. They were importing jewellery of a local version of jet. They were bringing in material from the south of Scotland. They even had access to gold. A tiny scrap, admittedly. Yes, it's a normal-sized human hand, but the only piece of gold I've ever found in an excavation. But it's absolutely diagnostic. That little fragment there shows it comes from one of these things. Look at the form of the end of it. So this was a place whose inhabitants were dealing in gold. This was a place with contacts and connections. And it was those contacts and connections that led to the interest of the Roman world. So we see a range of Roman imports coming onto the site. Rome is dealing with people beyond the frontier as a way of keeping the peace, building links to these northern groups. You can't fight everybody. And staying on friendly terms is no bad thing. So 
wonderful brooches. This cute little beast here, the Burnley Budgie, uh, my favourite find from the site. It's not really a budgie, I should emphasise, <laughs> but it's, the alliteration is too good to refuse. And the fragment of a glass vessel here that originally came from a high quality item like this. We need always to make this leap from the broken fragments we find to how impressive these things would once have looked like. These were real status symbols in Iron Age society. But what about the coins? Well, working with the detectress, we were able to pin down where the scatter of coins was coming from and locate in a moment of genuine Indiana Jones stuff, locate the remains of the coin hoard at the base of the plough soil. And in fact, excavation showed this was not just a solitary coin hoard. The following season, we found another one, like buses. Coin hoards come along in twos, apparently. Here we see them after restoration, and you get a sense in this photograph of the impact, the visual impact of silver. Two hoards, round about 300 coins, buried just a few years apart, AD 193, AD 196. And this is one of the key pieces of information, that these are coins being sent north from the Roman world at regular intervals. This is a policy. There's a bureaucrat behind this, ticking off his coin hoards on his wax tablet. So here we're seeing the policy of Rome, not just for Scotland, this is something happening all across the northern frontier. Diplomacy in action. And when you see, when you remember the scale of Rome's northern frontier, you realise how the army alone is an insufficient tool to keep the peace. You need the politics, you need the silver in order to control the scale of area, to deal with these groups beyond the frontier. So from the Atlantic to the Black Sea, Silver is the diplomatic currency. But what use is it? In a world that doesn't use coinage, what is the value of silver? You might think it's a raw material. You might think it's to be melted down. And in some parts of Europe, they do that. On the continent, these silver coins are indeed melted down and reused, but not north of Hadrian's Wall. We've analysed every crucible we can lay our hands on and there is no trace of silver working at this time. The power of silver, it seems, required it to stay as a coin. The face of the emperor was critical here. And I think it's because it's a new material, this exotic new material with the mark of Rome on it, the face of the emperor himself, gives this a power. If you're getting access to this material, you're someday important. If I have this silver and you don't, I'm someday important and you're not. This becomes a local power tool, a way of showing off. Then maybe I give you some of my coins and suddenly this is a way, if you like, a social currency of building connections between people. This stuff becomes critical. It becomes things to show off with, things to seal alliances with, things to hire mercenaries with, perhaps things to give to the gods. Because this comes to the question of why do you bury this stuff? Well, at Burnie, we have answers from the edge of the trowel. We could excavate the area where the coins came from to get a sense of why they would bury this silver. The red circles are houses. The blue stars are the two coin hoards. One of them straight outside the door of a house, the other one off to one side. These are not hidden. These are not in the dark corners of the houses. They're out in the open. And the three yellow squares are other odd deposits. A smashed pot, an intact quern stone, an exotic whetstone. These are offerings or sacrifices, I think. This silver was seen as powerful material fit to offer to the gods. So silver becomes really important. This new material flooding into certain people's hands becomes really important. But you need to be careful. This is not just a lottery win. Rome is not just a charity giving out silver 
to these groups beyond the frontier. The Romans, of course, have motives. They have reasons for doing this. They are trying to control their frontier. They give some groups coins and not others. They build up dependencies. They build tensions between one group and another. They're trying to use this as a diplomatic tool, not just to buy peace, but to create dissent beyond the frontier. If I have silver and you don't, maybe you come and get it off me. Maybe this causes tension between these groups. And then the silver flow stops. They stop giving silver to the north. And the results we can see again from the excavations. From this site at Burnley, these are the radiocarbon dates. An initial start in the Bronze Age and then a booming village from about 200 BC to around about AD 200. The coin hoards date to there. So within a generation, if not less, of the coin hoards coming to this site, the site is abandoned. And the picture is the same all the way across northeastern Scotland. The traditional way of life is abandoned. We struggle to find the archaeology of the third and fourth centuries. And what we're seeing here, I would argue, is the destabilizing effect of silver. This new material comes in like a bonanza and then is ripped away. And in the process, it has destabilized these societies, become used to it, and then have to live without it. The Romans are playing politics. They're trying to buy peace or create peace, which in the short term is successful, but in the long term is disastrous. Because out of this policy of unsettling the north comes the Picts. The Picts effectively are an anti-Roman group that emerges out of the chaos of the third century. And they become one of the real problem people on the northern frontier, causing continual chaos. A creature of Rome, in one sense, created by Roman dabbling. There's, a, there's an object lesson in there about empires dabbling in worlds they don't understand. <laughs> so. But the, silver, the story of silver moves on. So step one, coming in with the Romans. Step two, politics. Step three is very different indeed, from coins to hack silver. What you may ask is hack silver. Hack silver is the poor relation of Roman silver. Most Roman specialists study this kind of stuff, lovely intact tableware. It takes a certain kind of mentality to find the broken and battered bits interesting. It's always been the unglamorous end of Roman silver. And yet it's fascinating. And I hope to convince you of why it's so fundamental. Hack silver, if you're a good classical art historian, hack silver is clearly stuff created by decadent barbarians who cannot understand this fine, good quality art and chop it to bits in a frenzy of looting. And this has indeed been the standard interpretation of hack silver for a long time. This is the work of barbarians, because who else would chop up fine classical art? But the story is more complicated. And over the last few years, um, a team at the museum with colleagues from elsewhere has been looking again at this question. Hack silver is not just a barbarian phenomenon. The dotted line is the Roman frontier. The red dots occur on both sides of it, inside and outside the Roman Empire. And that gives you pause for thought. Why is it turning up on both sides? And then you look at it in more detail. And you realise a lot of it is being chopped up really rather carefully. These are fairly obsessive compulsive barbarians, if that is indeed <laughs> what they're doing. Dishes chopped into quarters or chopped into sixths. They're being very irregular about their damage and destruction of this evil classical art. And you then realise that they're also gathering them into groups of certain weights. So at the top here, this motley gathering of silver is exactly half a Roman pound. Bottom left from Water Newton in Suffolk, one pound and two pounds of Roman silver. People chopping silver up rather carefully to Roman economic standards, 
This sounds like something being done inside the Roman world. And what you're seeing really is the archaeology of economic crisis. At times when the economy is not doing very well, people convert their valuable objects into bullion. When you can't trust the currency. There's phases in the 3rd and 4th century when the Roman currency is being heavily devalued. Silver and gold keep their value. It's not dissimilar to today. At times of economic crisis, the price of gold and silver goes up. So this is you turning your wealth into bullion that you can then use to exchange. Now, for a long time, north of the frontier, this story was dominated by one find, the find from Traprain Law in East Lothian. And I'll come back to it later on. But first, I want to introduce you to a new hack silver hoard, stealing Traprain's thunder. One of the things I love about working in a museum is you never know what's going to turn up in your, in your inbox or in your post box or at the door. And the day that this particular image turned up in my inbox was really quite an exciting day. This was the aftermath of a metal detecting rally. We think we found something interesting. Does anyone want to have a look at it? Too damn right we want to have a look at it. <laughs> this came from an area where there was no archaeological remains known, from Dersey in Fife. So here we are, Edinburgh's here, Fife is the peninsula here. There she sits near St Andrews, a field where nothing was known until a metal detecting rally was held there really because the land was available. And most of what came out of the field was the usual, you know, bits of tractor and tin can and musket balls. But then a 14-year-old schoolboy, David Hall, found the first fragments of silver and realised there was something significant to them. Well, the find was reported to the Treasure Trove unit and they got me involved because they know my weakness for silver and all kinds of shiny things, the magpie element of a museum person. And we went back out to work with the metal detectorists in excavating their finds. Um, very little of the hoard survived in the ground and in fact only one fragment did survive and they'd lifted that themselves unfortunately on the first day. But we were able to go back, plot where things were coming from and work out um, the spread of material. So we have a technique with these things. We gently strip the topsoil away and then working with the detectorists, plot where finds are coming from. Every flag was a fragment of silver. They'd found round about 200 on the first day. We found 200 more with our gradual excavation. But this wasn't just a treasure hunt. When you're excavating one of these sites, it's not what you're finding, it's what you're finding out. Why is it buried there? Why is silver at this place in the ground? Well, once we got below the plough soil and the skills of the trowel took over from those of the metal detector, we began to reveal a story. As we cleaned up the natural subsoil, you'll begin to see interesting black patches and stony bits. Foundation pits for standing stones. There was an older monument here from the Bronze Age, already ancient by the time the silver was buried. And in fact, the silver was buried between a pair of standing stones and in the background, a peat bog. These wet places, like peat bogs, are like the wishing wells of prehistory. They're often seen as sacred or special sites their offerings are made. And the same is true of the two of the standing stones. These were ancient already. These would have had stories, myths and legends. This was not just a handy spot in the landscape to chuck some silver in the ground. This was a special place, a memorable place, perhaps even a sacred place, silver being placed under the care of the gods. So the digging gave us a story. It let us understand, or give us some better explanations, as to why that silver was buried there. But what of the silver itself? 408 fragments. But that is not how they went into the ground. For this hoard was hacked twice. First by the Romans, and then by the plough. Gradually scalped 
in plough after plough, fragment after fragment coming off these vessels. And our conservators have had the devil's own job in trying to piece all these fragments together. But the results were well worthwhile. Because from these 408 fragments, there are only four vessels. And you see them here. A folded cylinder, fragments of a dish, of a basin, and of a bowl. Let's look at them in more detail. The cylinder is a puzzling thing. It looks to be a flawed casting or an object being recycled. The bubbles in there come from the heating process. So this, it seems, was silver in the process of being transformed. These come from a dish originally almost 40 centimetres in diameter with originally a beautifully decorated central medallion and a beaded rim decoration. And this example from Shores in Picardy gives you some idea of how it would once have looked. The third vessel was a washing basin used for washing your hands at the feast originally. And again, a find from the Shores hoard gives you an idea of it. But it had been cut up, cut in half, each half then subdivided, and only two parts of that put in the ground, carefully folded into packages and placed in the ground. So only parts of these vessels are being buried. It may be only parts ever came north. <coughs> the final vessel was the most fragmentary for us, but actually probably went into the ground intact. It's hard to appreciate from this jumble of tiny fragments, but let me zoom in to one detail. And you can see a vase with grapes piled high, vines scrolling out of the sides of it. And we've been able, with relatively little invention, um, to restore the decoration of something like this, with a frieze of olive wreath running around the top, olive wreath running around the top, and then alternating circles and these vases with a pair of arches at opposite sides of the vessel. The decoration is punched in from the outside. You'd have appreciated it as you used it, as you drank from it. It is a vessel for the consumer rather than the observer. And they're typical of the northwestern provinces, France, Germany and Britain, made probably in these areas. Here we see an example again from the Schuer's Hoard to give you an idea. And look at the scrolling vine in the base of that. These were once dramatic vessels. But three of them are chopped to bits, and the fourth, it seems, is placed over the top as a lid for this hoard. And that's why the base of it has been so brutally truncated. But the fragments belie their significance. Because the parallels for these, the stylistic parallels for these, date to the end of the 3rd century, around about AD 300. This is the earliest hacksilver hoard known beyond the edge of the Roman Empire. This is a new policy, a shift from coins to silver bullion, a new way of paying off barbarians. And it becomes the way the Romans run this policy for the next 150 years or so. And that brings us to Traprain Law. Traprain is an incredible site, a site that I can only describe in superlatives. It lies some 30 kilometres to the east of Edinburgh, the red dot here, this massive um, stone whale growing out of the East Lothian landscape. A power centre in the Roman period, the place to be, the centre of a kingdom it seems, a place that received a wealth of Roman material. More Roman objects from Traprain than the rest of Iron Age Scotland put together. Pottery, glass, brooches, even people learning Latin. Scotland's earliest schoolroom exercise here. And this shouldn't really be a surprise. We have evidence elsewhere of the children of, of kings beyond the frontier learning Latin, even serving in the Roman world. Well, here we see an archaeological hint of exactly that story. Well, in the 3rd and 4th centuries, this period when the Romans have pulled back to Hadrian's Wall, they stay on contact with the people in Traprain. 
and we see high quality objects. Things like this on the right hand side, this beautiful engraved glass fragment, even in its fragmentary condition, you can appreciate just how impressive a vessel that once came from. The one on the left perhaps looks less impressive. This comes from our own excavations uh, there some 10 years ago now. A bit of broken milk bottle or iron brew bottle, you might think. But the decoration is absolutely characteristic of one of these things. A claw beaker, the height of taste in the 5th century. The height of pretty bad taste, I would say, but <laughs> it is still a highly desirable item. And this is the kind of thing that shows continuing connections between the people on Traprain and the Roman world. Collections, connections that also involved service in the Roman army. There are military belt fittings and brooches that show that some people in Traprain had links to the Roman world. So where does that take us with the interpretation of this great treasure from Traprain? 23 kilograms of silver. The biggest hack silver hoard from anywhere, full stop. And we pulled it together for the first time last year, all on the one table to photograph it. The first time it had been photographed altogether since 1919. I have worked with this material for 25 years. When I saw it on that table, I saw it in a way I've never seen it before. You realize the power of silver when you see it all together. Now we're drawing to the end of a research project in this material and one of the things we've been looking at is the idea of the lives of silver. Because this stuff may have ended its life on Traprain, it started it somewhere in the Mediterranean as fine tableware. And this selection of the more intact pieces gives you an idea of the quality of silver in the late Roman world. The silver that would grace the dining rooms of the elite the bowls and the flagons and the dishes and the cups and the spoons that would be used for serving, for fine dining in the Roman world. Now with these more intact pieces, I should say they weren't intact, they were, they were heavily restored. They were the treatment, when they were discovered, they went to some silversmiths who made them look beautiful, but the treatment they went through would make you weep as a curator. You know, they heated them up and battered them and hammered them and dipped them in acid and they said, oh, don't do that. But the result is it's left it looking as it, as it would have been in a Roman dinner table. But this is not true of all the fragments. So with some of the fragments, it's quite hard to appreciate how they would once have looked. This digital reconstruction, which we did from the last phase of the Glenmorangie project, is based on these two tiny fragments. But you work out the diameter of them, and they are 70 centimetres across. This was one of the top 10 dishes known from the Roman world. Originally a spectacular item. But these objects were not being used as tableware when they came to Traprain. And the hoard has a whole mixture of material. So take a couple of these items and we see the mixture of beliefs in the late Roman world. On the right, one of the earliest Christian items from Britain. And the scene here shows the Virgin and the Christ Child receiving the three wise men. But on the left, Hercules, the great hero with his club behind him, straight from the pages of classical mythology. So a mix of both pagan and Christian. And when we look at the hoard as a whole, we see it's been brought together from lots of different sources. 18 different owners have left their names in graffiti on these plates. This has been brought together from multiple different sources. Even if we move away from the tableware and look at the belt fittings, remains of military belts, but from four different belts, none of them complete. Silver was being gathered up, chopped to bits, and sent north. But Traprain is one of these hordes where we first got the clue about the care in the chopping. Not only as we've seen before, the careful chopping into quarters. But these two fragments I showed you a minute ago, you add their weight together, they weigh exactly eight Roman ounces. And if you plot the weights of all the different fragments here, you'll see there are steps in the distribution, steps that correlate to Roman weight units. Not all of them. 
Some of them may have been chopped up afterwards, but the origins of this system, the origins of this chopping, lies in the Roman world. Now let's go back to the map I showed you a few minutes ago. I said that hack silver is occurring on both sides of the frontier. That's true. It's a Roman economic response. You also see some of it beyond the frontier. But the map is slightly misleading. The accurate picture is this. The red dots are hordes dominated by hack silver. The open circles are ones where it's a small component. And suddenly, at this point, the distribution becomes more barbarian. Silver, hack silver, is, is moving in quantity beyond the frontier. Why is that happening? Well, one reason might be military. It's a way of paying for soldiers. The late Roman army is not what it once was, you know. This is not the great army of the first and second centuries. They will hire anybody in the late Roman army. You have your own teeth and uh, you're looking fairly fit. Yeah, we'll have you. Come along. Can you hold a sword? That'll be great. And they're recruiting troops from all around the edges of the empire, both inside and outside. On the left, you see an image from a late Roman document, the Notitia Dignitatum, which effectively is showing Roman military pay, gold coins and silver vessels. And much of this silver is being made for Roman pay, and we suspect for groups beyond the frontier is then being chopped up and used as bullion to pay the war band as they head north again. So maybe it's military paid, that's plausible. It might also be back to our diplomacy. Here we see on the left a dice tower from Western Germany. It says, the Picts are defeated, the enemy destroyed, let us play the game. One of the earliest mentions of the Picts outside purely literary sources. And diplomacy, the paying off of people as a way of defeating the Picts, remains a key element of this story. We can see traces of this diplomacy in the archaeological record. So returning to Scotland, off the western edge of Hadrian's Wall, there's a cluster of gold. Much of it gifts from the emperor himself. A medallion of Constantius Chlorus. A gold brooch given by Diocletian to some um, loyal servant. Perhaps somebody who's serving to sustain Hadrian's Wall. So gold and silver move north as diplomatic gifts. And the two hack silver hordes we have from Dersey and Traprain are part of a buffer, a cushion, if you like, between Hadrian's Wall and these evil, nasty Picts developing up here. Now, this silver is different from the coins. This silver is bullion. It's already pre-chopped. What do you do with it? You chuck it in the melting pot. And analysis of the crucibles from Traprain Law have shown traces of silver on them. This is now raw material. It becomes the raw material of choice for the next 600 years, melting down Roman silver and turning it into local prestige goods. Some of them wee things, finger rings and pins that would glint and gleam in the sunshine and would mark you out as somebody special. Some of them, shall we say, rather less understated. These things, the massive silver chains, nine of which survive, weighing a total of 11 kilograms. These things are beasts. Huge, massive choker chains. The dimensions of them, they wouldn't fit me. They suggest it's for women or adolescents, I would suggest. Marks of, marks of power, marks of status, particularly in eastern in northeastern Scotland. At the time of peak silver beyond the wall, this becomes the, what you do with your Roman silver. Melt it down and rework it into these symbols of Rome's favour. Well, that's fine, as long as you have silver. But what do you do when the wall stops working? What do you do at the end of the Roman period when the silver stops flowing? because you're reliant on this Roman silver. Well, they're canny. This Roman silver is now recycled and reused for the next several hundred years. So we have two hordes from the early medieval period, most likely from the fifth century. 
From Norrie's Law in Fife, this amalgamation of around a hundred and something fragments, only a, a fragment of what was once found. There was probably 12 kilograms of silver here. Most of it unfortunately melted down shortly after discovery. Now the hoard has never been fully studied. People tend to focus on the small number of iconic pieces, the artistic objects. But actually the clues are in the fragments. Step beyond the more intact objects and look at glamorous pieces like this. This is fascinating because it comes from one of these. It's a late Roman spoon. It's a visual reminder that the Roman silver is behind this. Roman fingerprints are behind this silver. Some we can see, some we find by analysis. We've been doing a program of scientific research that has pinpointed characteristic Roman silver. So there's more Roman fragments in this material here. But the Norris Law Hoard has lots of interesting stories. Take these two silver plaques. Look at them quite closely because they are not what they seem. These have been in the collection in the museum since the late 19th century as two wonderful Pictish plaques with these wonderful Pictish symbols on them. But my colleagues Alice Blackwell and Martin Goldberg had a closer look at them and began to worry a little bit. They are so similar. In fact, the one on the right seems to be copying elements of the one on the left. Even the, the damage on this one has been copied on this one. And they zoomed in again and they looked at the decoration. And this is how you make one of these wonderful spiraling decorative pieces using compasses. These are the marks of compasses. And you can even see with little bevels there where it's been turned twice to make this pattern. And on the other one, the marks are in the wrong place. And that is not how a compass works. The right hand one is a copy. A 19th century copy <laughs> by a dodgy silversmith. So the hoard was found, much of it was sold, some of it was melted and melted down. It seems some of it was then used to make fakes from. So this is a fake. Of our two plaques, only one is original. But where does this come from? What, are, what is this silver being used for? Well, this particular plaque has long been a source of contention. People have suggested it might be a votive plaque, similar to these Romano-British things. Votive or religious use is the classic archaeological get-out clause when you don't really know what something is. That, horse harness or musical instrument are the three standard explanations for uh, of things you can't tell what they are. I have a far better explanation for this, but don't tell anybody. One of these things. This is an early medieval helmet. This particular one is from Morkan eh, near Bonn. Look at the shape of the plaques. Now, this is not exactly the same. The form is different, it's a little bit smaller, um, but I think it's from, one, it's from one of these styles of composite helmet. A Pictish helmet inspired by knowledge of these, of these continental types. And here, courtesy of our illustrator Alan Braby, are two highly speculative reconstructions, but they give you an idea of how this plaque could have been used. This is the problem of these hordes. We find only fragments, and it requires something of a leap of the imagination to understand how they would once have looked. Now, I could be totally wrong on this, but I think it's a more plausible explanation, and it shows us the powerful object this material is being used for. So for military equipment, and also for jewellery. And our fourth hoard I want to talk about from Gall Cross in the northeast of Scotland, the fourth of these hack silver hoards. Found in clearing two stone circles from the land in the early 19th century. The stone circles were blown up and pieces of silver were gathered. People did terrible things to ancient monuments 150 years ago. And recovered from that was this pin, a bangle, and a chain. It looked like a hoard of Pictish jewellery. Until my colleague Martin Goldberg and Gordon Noble from Aberdeen University went back to the fine spot and working with local metal detectorists discovered this silver wasn't alone. There were another 90 fragments. And whereas what had been recovered before was complete, 
Now we have fragments. So this, again, is hack silver, the fourth of our hack silver hoards. And lurking in here are the things we would expect, the Roman coins, Roman military equipment, bits of bangles like we saw from the hoard, bits of Roman spoons, ingots, a classic stage in recycling metal, hacked up bits of brooches, bizarre things, which I have no idea what they are yet, a real mixture of material gathered together, every little scrap, because silver is so important, because silver is how you're showing your power. So in this period, the 5th century or so, silver is used for a range of objects, for the great chains, for the brooches, for the pins, for the finger rings. But it's silver, not gold. If we look at the continent in this time, the hordes of gold in them. Roman gold coins being turned into local prestige goods. If we go back to our hack silver map and the two main areas where hack silver is found, Scotland and Ireland on the one hand, G um, North Germany and Denmark on the other, the yellow dots mark the hordes with gold. Gold is only found on the continent. Now I think there's two things going on here. One is supply. This gold is Roman gold. It's coming from the Roman world. It's a way of paying off these tribes beyond the frontier to buy the peace. On the continent, they are buying peace in gold and silver. Now, there is some gold. I mean, Britain is a country rich in gold in the late Roman period, but very little of that is going beyond the frontier. I think because the continental frontier is a more dangerous one. There's a more mass of humanity, of armed humanity, threatening the frontier. So supply is a part of it. Less gold is going beyond the British frontier. But I think there's also an issue of demand. Gold is well known in Britain. People have been using gold for thousands of years. Silver retains an exotic element. And I would argue there is also a deliberate choice. Silver is what these people want. Because silver is something special. And they use silver to mark themselves out as, as different. You look in the Anglo-Saxon world a century or two later and it's gold, gold and garnet, which is the prestige material. In the insular world, in Scotland and Ireland, silver is the power material of choice. And this is choice. They are choosing to show a difference in this material. So silver is being used for personal ornaments, for jewellery, for finger rings and pins and brooches. Well, our next shift is round about AD 600, a dominance of brooches. Brooches become the material of choice. Brooches are the status symbol. And this seems to represent a more hierarchical society because the kind of brooch, the size of brooch, the material of the brooch exactly marks out who you are. Subtle gradations of status. My brooch is bigger than your brooch. And you see new elements beginning to appear in these brooches. They begin to get blinged up with bits of gold and bits of uh, glass and bits of amber, marking out cultural connections, connections down to the south, to the Anglo-Saxon world. This is seen really clearly in one of the great treasures of the museum in Edinburgh, the Hunterston brooch from Ayrshire. You look at this brooch and it looks golden. And the decorative styles, the coiling beasts here and here, those are taken from Anglo-Saxon technologies. This is showing links to the Anglo-Saxon world. You turn it round and its skeleton is silver. Silver is still the basis of this material. Gold is important, but silver is the basis. And now, finally, a few Vikings crop up right at the end of the story. Because this brooch was so valuable, 200 years after it was made, there's a runic inscription running around there. In Scandinavian runes, it says Melbrigta owned this brooch. This was a powerful object, carved by somebody there who still valued it 200 years after it was made, somebody using Scandinavian runes, although the name itself is Gaelic, interestingly. And the Vikings finally appear at the end of my story and the beginning of the next story, because this Roman silver is getting to the end of its life. 
It was a finite resource. People have been using it, diluting it, stretching it for several hundred years, adding copper to the melt to make the silver go further. Because if you polish hard enough, it still looks silvery. But after a few hundred years of burial, the truth comes out. So these are fragments from the St. Ninian's Isle hoard in Shetland. And you can see here, even the best efforts of our conservators couldn't remove the traces of green uh, corrosion here. This comes from copper. Some of this late silver of the 8th century is only 40% pure. They're stretching this Roman silver as far as they can go. So my story ends with the end of Roman silver, because the next step is the Vikings. It is the connection back into international trading networks. The Vikings are not just plundering and doing whatever else they do, but it's this link that we now get back into this world where Anglo-Saxon silver, where Arabic silver is flowing through, through into Scotland. And I couldn't resist but showing you, since you have such good material on display at the moment here in the museum here, the, 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 the York Hoard and the New Oxford Hoard, I couldn't resist showing you the best Viking Hoard from Britain. <laughs> The recently discovered Galloway hoard that we've recently we've been very fortunate to acquire, um, at one level, looks a classic Viking hoard. It's packed full of Viking silver folded up. But it's more than that. Because in this hoard we also have incredible Anglo-Saxon metalwork gathered together. Here a brooch and some kind of strap fitting. This amazing brooch here that seems to symbolize the senses with the wee figures with their ears literally ringing and the horns being blown. This seems to say symbolize the senses. It's not just about silver. There is the odd nice little gold knick-knack lurking in there as well. This wonderful gold pin. And the reason I show this is not just to say what a lovely Viking hoard it is, but it's to emphasize again the connectedness of this material. Silver is a story of connections. And you look at the Galloway hoard, it's much more than a Viking hoard. You've got material coming in, yes, from Scandinavian networks, from the Irish Sea, from the Anglo-Saxon world, from the continent, probably from Byzantium as well. And my colleague Martin Goldberg, who you see lurking behind a brooch top right there, will be working on this part of the story over the next couple of years. So that's my seven steps of silver. The story of a power material over a thousand years, coming in with the Roman army used in frontier diplomacy. Its effects ultimately disastrous, I would argue, for the local population. Hack silver as a new phenomenon, a different way of dealing within the Roman world with crisis beyond the Roman world as politics. And this silver for the first time is melted down and turned into local prestige goods. We see a shift to uh, the hacking of this stuff themselves as the supplies drop off, harvesting and husbanding silver to keep it going and turning it into prestige goods such as brooches, the signs of a new, more hierarchical society as kings and uh, royalty emerge within early medieval Scotland. And then, right at the end of the story, the beginning of the next chapter, the Viking silver coming in fresh from the continent and the Arab world. Seven steps, a thousand years. Don't just believe me, come and see the exhibition. <laughs> Open until February 25th. It's, a, it's an easy flight from Nottingham to Edinburgh, I discovered yesterday. If you can't make it to the exhibition, and it is free, I should emphasize, you can still buy the book. Thank you very much.